Many of the saints had worked long and hard to improve their land holdings, but were not allowed by the U.S. government to hold private property. Isn't that interesting? They weren't allowed to hold private property. However, because of the efforts of the School of the Prophets and U.S. government officials, most saints were aided in filling out the necessary paperwork to obtain the legal titles to their land. Brigham Young opposed trade of any kind with outsiders. He was very much intent on establishing this uh, United Order, this Law of Consecration, where we just bought and sold from each other. He's still trying to keep Utah and the, I should say, the larger church, which include Idaho, Colorado, and Mexico, and Arizona, and Utah, uh, separate from the rest of the United States. He realized that if Latter-day Saints became integrated into national markets, they would become suppliers of raw materials and then be forced to repurchase their own products manufactured elsewhere. Isn't that interesting? That is what happened, unfortunately, but he knew what happened. His supreme goal was economic independence and self-sufficiency. Brigham Young believed that the saints would just buy and sell to each other. They could, they could bypass uh, having to become suppliers of raw materials and repurchase their goods that they could just do with them among themselves. If Latter-day Saints became dependent on superior quality goods from the East, the development of local manufacturing would be impeded and the people impoverished. Let's talk about this for a second. If we became dependent upon the, the quality of goods from the East, which is what the world was trying to get us to do, the development of local manufacturing would be impeded and people would be impoverished because they would be able to, to buy all the stuff from the East. He understood that clearly. His answer was to condemn all trading from whatsoever sources. An unfortunate result of this, however, was it gave outsiders the advantage of taking the initiative and establishing trade in Utah, allowing them to create monopolies in targeted markets. In other words, they went against what the was saying and were able to benefit from it. In addition, beginning in the fall of 1868, Brigham Young taught openly from the pulpit the need to support one another economically to survive the influx of imports that the railroad would bring. That's also true. He said that every man, woman, and child should only purchase articles from their brethren who pay tithing, help gather the poor, pray with their families, and will use the profits to build the kingdom. Lorenzo Snow was asked by him to establish a cooperative society in Brigham City, Utah, as an experiment. Now, it's very clear that Brigham Young saw, had a vision that's different than the world is today. He saw the saints supporting each other, loving each other, and working hard together. And uh, to the degree that we followed him, we were successful. To the degree we didn't, we were not. In essence, this is how the co-op worked. The saints that desired would buy stock in the company. The funds obtained would be used to purchase goods, everything from food to livestock, to clothes, etc. Everyone would purchase all their goods at the cooperative store, and everyone would benefit from profits of their stock to the sale of their goods. It was a pretty simple plan, and it worked. It would work. Prices were set. These cooperatives were motivated by welfare more than profit. That is the key. They were motivated by the welfare of the saints rather than the profit of the saints. That is a higher, a higher plane than we're living on today. Patronage was an act of religious loyalty. The church was involved in the organization, operation, and financing of these establishments. No one can sit and talk all day about why these didn't work, etc., but the bottom line it boils down to this selfishness.
there are people that want the deposit himself and not for the church. That's sort of that's what the Bible is down to. This is a picture of the parent cooperative in Salt Lake City called Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution, or ZCMI. Within six weeks of the opening of this parent co-op, there were 81 other stores in the territory. Behind me is the cast iron facade of the Zions Cooperative Mercantile Institution. It came about when Brigham Young noticed there was price gouging for basic commodities out here in the early pioneer territory. The reason is those basic commodities needed to come from the east across the plains hauled by ox team from Missouri. Local Salt Lake merchants took advantage of that situation and charged exorbitant prices for basic commodities. For example, a sack of sugar cost $100, and remember, that's 100 pioneer dollars. Brigham Young's answer to that situation was to encourage the saints to form and organize cooperatives. The saints benefited not only from the lower prices, but also they had an outlet where they could sell their goods. Now, the original building on Main Street that's located behind the facade was constructed in three sections between 1876 and 1901. Now, during the more than 100 years that have passed since that time, there's been various wings added, and the original building is the cooperative expanded, and it also modernized. They included electricity and put in cash registers, elevators. Earlier, they had coal oil lamps. And they used to have these big black kettles where they'd put all the money that came in, and then periodically, store clerks would come by, gather up the black kettles, take them to the office where the money would be counted. In 1972, the original building was raised to make room for a new ZCMI building, but the old facade was preserved and the Main Street entrance became part of what is known as the ZCMI Center Mall, one of the largest covered shopping malls in the country. In the year 2000, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sold all of its ZCMI holdings to the May department store chain, Meyer & Frank. That facade is a beautiful historic landmark and a reminder of the ingenuity of early settlers in Utah. For more information on Hallowed Ground Sacred Journeys, please visit virtual. Eventually, there were 150 throughout Utah and southern Idaho. These co ops were extremely successful. until the nationwide economic panic of 1873. In addition to these retail establishments, the church also operated cooperative ironworks, co cooperative banks, cooperative textile factories, provo cooperative woolen mills. So you see very much that the church was trying to get involved in all kinds of um, Private producing enterprises to to strain out to keep out the asset sources. A distinctive aspect of 19th century life in the Great Basin that reinforced the community pattern of cooperation was the practice of plural marriage. That's an important sentence. Something that reinforced the community pattern of cooperation was the practice of plural marriage. How would that be? The creation of large family units permitted greater individual specialization among family members and a higher degree of self-sufficiency. That's very interesting. The creation of large family units permitted greater individual specialization among family members and a higher degree of self-sufficiency. Since land was allotted on the basis of families, one lot and farming acreage for each wife and her children, 
plurality created larger units of operation and greater opportunities for managerial skill. It also resulted in greater equality in levels of living, since most plural households provided homes for the poor and unfortunate. A major aspect of Joseph Smith's life's work was an effort to organize and unify for himself and his followers a structured haven in a society that seemed about to disintegrate from the excesses of individualism and pluralism. Two things are very guilty of today. The law of consecration and stewardship, which Joseph Smith received by revelation in February 1831, Doctrine and Covenants, section 42, know variously as the Order of Enoch or the United Order, was intended to be a major instrument in reorganizing the social and economic patterns of life among his followers. You see here a kind of a, a drawing of how the law of consecration worked. You have the haves and the have-nots who legally convey their real and personal property to the church and who combine it in the bishop's storehouse. The haves consecrated property it becomes a surplus for them. Have not consecrated properly becomes a non surplus for them, and they receive some of it as a stewardship and surplus profits, and the rich also receive a stewardship, but with surplus profits, equal positions according to the to the needs of the circumstances. So this is the way of helping the poor. It would provide a model upon which all human society would be organized when the Savior returned to the Latter day Zion in Missouri. It would build unity among a people fragmented by the individualistic search for economic well-being and an excess of liberty. An ideal community, divested of greed and selfishness, living in square survey towns, surrounded by productive farmlands, prepared for the Savior's millennial reign. The success of the cooperative system was seen as merely a stepping stone towards this higher order, the Order of Enoch. The Brethren preached this order for several months in an attempt to prepare the saints for it. The Depression of 1873, the need for the Church to return to the principles of the Law of Consecration, and the economic struggles of the saints in southern Utah, led to the establishment of several orders of Enoch. Also, village life in southern Utah had been disrupted for a few years by the mining industry headquartered in nearby Pioche, Nevada. Building materials and foodstuffs among the saints had been drawn away by the miners, causing a shortage in the Mormon communities. Several young men had left their homes for the mining camps to obtain cash wages, where they were subject to influences of the world. How sad. This also caused labor shortages at home. Brigham Young taught that all efforts to establish Zion, no matter how mundane, were part of the sacred work of the Lord. Recently, he had urged the saints to shop only at cooperatives and other businesses where the words holiness to the Lord appear somewhere on the establishment. By supporting these stores, the women work for the good of the saints, not outsider merchants. The first order was established in St. George. Each member recommitted to keeping the commandments by rebaptism into the order. The members agreed to follow a list of 14 spiritual rules, such as not taking the name of deity in vain, observing the word of wisdom more fully, treating family members with kindness and affection, living the law of chastity, keeping the Sabbath day holy, and wearing non-extravagant clothing. Here's a picture of the rules that should be observed by members of the United Order. And this is the actual document that they agreed to. We will not take the name of the Indian in vain. We will pray with our families morning and evening. 
will observe the Hebrew word of wisdom, etc. They agreed to this, with these 14 rules to become part of the United Order. The community would eat together, pray together, and work together. It's very much a unified system. In the evening, fruitful entertainment and schools for improvement would be provided. Not all the orders were the same. Some required the consecration of all properties, St. George. Others continued successful cooperatives, Brigham City. Others were communal, Orderville. Others were local wards, Salt Lake and Provo. Convinced that conditions were right for establishing united orders throughout Zion, Brigham Young dispatched church leaders to organize all the southern settlements according to the St. George model. By the end of 1874, over 200 united orders were established in Latter-day Saint settlements, including settlements in Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona. In Ogden, Provo, and Logan, more than one order was set up, with each one specializing in different production projects. Salt Lake City had a separate order for each of its 20 wards. So as you can see, this is quite an organized system. Set up to so the system just by itself from each other. Not pride, but zealotry was what concerned Brigham Young. Be sure and not urge anyone to join this holy order against their will, he instructed the Mormon apostles. Such as do not wish to join, treat them with all the kindness and fellowship, as though they were in the order. Unfortunately, the reluctance of some church leaders, including Brigham Young, to deed over their hard-earned properties and business interests provided a field day for the anti-Mormon press. Brigham Young said to the saints in Lehi, I am laboring under a certain embarrassment with regard to deeding property, and that is to find men who know what to do with property when it is in their hands, when a factory in Provo or Salt Lake, owned by him, can go into the hands of men who know not what to do with it, it will go. Such men apparently never were found. Other challenges included a drop in the payment of tithes and offerings. Members thought they were exempt. In the United Order, they thought they were doing everything, so they shouldn't pay the tithing. While the order was required to build houses for its members, Brigham Young did not want individual houses, but one house large enough to accommodate the entire organization. General management of the order sought local autonomy over central control which was difficult when considering old friendships, relationships, and experiences, and in fighting over who would control the organization locally, especially over a county. In other words, we had a heavenly system run by people, and that was the problem. Brigham Young's plans for church-wide united order ultimately failed. The people, contrary to what he had thought a few months earlier, were not ready for unity in temporal affairs. When practical considerations were squarely faced, it was obvious that to place property in the control of the inexperienced or the incompetent was a waste. On the other hand, many were distrustful either of the integrity or ability of those placed in control of the branches of the order and were therefore unwilling to transfer titles to their properties. In addition, men of means were less willing to join the order than those of lesser means. Orders fared better in rural areas than in urban areas because their fraternal feeling already existed. Orders also fared better in communities that have overcome a common struggle or adversity together. Orders with greater longevity resembled Christian military camps more than an individual, more than an individual, individualistic society of free men and women who regimented bugle calls, dinner and prayer times, community dining halls, and mandatory curfew and bedtimes. 
Some orders, like the one in Orderville, prospered for a decade with everyone wearing the same clothing, locally manufactured, and in the blessings and work of locally produced everything. Most orders didn't fare as well, abandoned by 1877 because of selfishness and economic pressures locally and national. Many positive results of this decade-long practice of cooperatives and united orders. The Saints became less dependent on imports, which decreased dramatically. The positive traits of thrift and industry were developed. The cooperative movement helped build the Manti, Logan, and St. George and Salt Lake Temples. Economic inequality diminished. Local production and investment increased. So there were a lot of positives that happened because of the establishment of the United Order, and as well as the negative with the fact that it failed because people were selfish. Brigham Young believed that with all the foreign language speaking saints who were immigrating to Utah, English would be, be English would be problematic, and a new alphabet might stimulate unity among the saints. The Book of Mormon and several other school books were printed with this alphabet, and attempts to teach it were tried, but the experiment did not work. Over and over again, we see the experiments not working, but lessons are still learned. Principles of the Gospel learned from this time period. Number one, it is okay to be in the world as long as we never become of the world. That's a struggle we're still combating today. Number two, it is okay to withdraw from the tendencies of the world and be different. Still trying to do that today. Number three. We can be much more successful if we work together. Boy, that's the truth. Number four. Selfishness and greed can destroy Zion at any time or in any place or circumstance. Boy, is that the truth. Those desiring to be in the world and of it often lose their place in the kingdom. I think all five of these lessons are still true today, and we see that Brigham Young and the Saints actually tried to combat them during the 19th century. Legislators in Washington, D.C. Were, propo were proposing new laws to strengthen the 1862 Moral Anti-Bigamy Act. In December 1869, Senator Aaron Cragen proposed a bill that, among other things, would deny the saints the right to a trial by jury in polygamy cases. Later that month, Representative Shelby Cullum introduced another bill that would fine and prison and deny citizenship to Latter-day Saints who practice plural marriage. These are some pretty serious uh, accusations against saints. Women drafted resolutions to use their moral influence to stop the bills. They expressed their indignation against the men who introduced the legislation to Congress and resolved to petition the governor of Utah for the right of women to vote in the territory. They also resolved to send two female representatives to Washington, D.C. to lobby on the saints' behalf. Soon after, the Deseret News reported speeches made at indignation meetings in settlements throughout the territory. Since the Cragen and Cullen bills characterized plural marriage as a kind of slavery, many women who spoke at these meetings emphasized their right to marry the man of their choice. The Utah legislature voted unanimously to pass a bill granting the right to vote to women. An official copy of the bill was sent to the acting governor who signed it into law. While a new law granting voting rights to women was cause for celebration, it did little to ease the saints' anxieties about the anti-polygamy bills under review in Washington, which Congress could pass whether Utah voters supported them or not. Despite the efforts of church leaders to control prices and maintain independence from the merchants of Babylon, both Latter-day Saint and Gentile merchants increased in number and influence. Many of the latter came to be among the bitterest enemies of the church, not only opposed to these policies in Utah, but generating anti-Mormon feelings 
throughout the nation and Congress. A group of self-proclaimed liberals led by William Godby, Godby. Godby claimed that Utah should focus on their mineral production instead of livestock and agriculture, and that they should benefit from trading with outsiders. Now, William Godby was a faithful member of the Church in England. He was a missionary, etc. But he came to Utah and he became very much engrossed in this idea that we should be liberal, we should be able to sell to trade with whoever we want, we should focus on Utah's mineral resources and not on their agricultural resources. William believed the prophet was old-fashioned and exerted too much influence over the lives of the saints. Before the cooperative movement began, merchants like William had enjoyed more control over the local market, allowing them to charge high prices and get rich. Under the new system, however, the church sought to keep prices low to benefit poor saints and the local cooperative stores. With his grasp on the market weakening, William had become irritated with Brigham's emphasis on the sacredness of cooperation. So you see that William's motives were primarily selfish. At that time, he had begun trying to communicate with the dead through spiritual, spiritualist seances. Spiritualism had become popular in the aftermath of the American Civil War, as people yearned to communicate with loved ones who had perished in the conflict. Church leaders had long condemned such practices, however, as counterfeit revelations from the adversary. Ignoring these warnings, William and Elias immersed themselves in seances and came to believe that they had spoken with the spirits of Joseph Smith, Heber Kimball, the Apostles Peter, James, and John, and even the Savior. Convinced these communications were real, William and Elias felt called on a special mission to rid the church of everything they considered to be false. When they returned to Utah, they began to publish subtle criticisms of church leaders and policies alongside more positive columns in the Utah Magazine. Soon after publishing his column on the Smith Brothers, Elias grew more aggressive in his attacks on Brigham Young and church policies. Sad, sad, sad. He argued that the cooperation movement robbed the saints of the competitive drive necessary to stimulate Utah's economy, which he thought was too weak to sustain itself on local manufacturing. He also reasoned that the saints were too selfish to sacrifice their own interests for the good of the community. Then on October 16th, Elias published an editorial urging the saints to develop Utah's mining industry. Over the years, Brigham Young had approved of some church-supported mining, but he worried that the discovery of valuable minerals would bring greater social problems and class divisions to the territory. And he was right. This concern had led him to preach aggressively against independent mining ventures in the territory. It soon became clear that Elias and William were carefully conspiring against the church. On October 18th, Orson Pratt, Wilford Woodruff, and George Q. Cannon met with the two men and some of their friends. Elias was full of bitterness, and neither man was willing to sustain the first presidency. Five days later, at a meeting of the Salt Lake City School of the Prophets, Williams stated that he had followed Brigham's, he had followed Brigham's economic counsel against his better judgment, and did not believe the prophet had a right to guide the saints in commercial matters. Elias spoke even more defiantly against Brigham's leadership. It is false. It is false, he shouted. A few days later, the Salt Lake City High Council met with Elias and William at the City Hall. At the city hall. Elias accused church, church leaders of acting as if they and their words were infallible. In rejecting counsel, William claimed that he and Elias were only following a higher spiritual authority 
an allusion to their spiritualist seances. We do not ignore the priesthood by any means, he insisted, but we do admit the existence of a power behind the veil from which influences and instructions do come and have always come by which the will may be guided in its onward path. After the two men spoke, Brigham addressed the High Council. I have never sought but one thing in this kingdom, he said, and that has been to get men and women to obey the Lord Jesus Christ in everything. He affirmed that all people had a right to think for themselves, just as church leaders had a right to counsel them according to Revelation. We work in harmony with our Savior, he declared. He works in harmony with his Father, and we cooperate with his Son for the salvation of ourselves and the human family. Brigham also rejected the idea that church leaders could not make mistakes. Man having the priesthood may be fallible, he declared. I do not pretend to be infallible, but this fallibility did not mean God could not work through him for the good of the saints. If William and Elias wanted to continue criticizing the church in the Utah magazine, Brigham Young believed, or Brigham believed that they were free to do so. He would continue to preach and practice cooperation, regardless of what they or outsider merchants did or said. I will leave it to the people to do as they have a mind to, he said. I have the right to counsel them, and they have the, the right to take my counsel or let it alone. When the hearing ended, the state president proposed excommunicating William and Elias from the church for apostasy. The High Council sustained the motion, and all but six people in the room, each an associate of Elias and William, sustained the decision. When reconciliation with the brethren was attempted, they rebelled and published the Salt Lake Tribune, a daily periodical offshoot from their original Utah magazine, and formed their own Church of Zion. They also formed the Liberal Party to oppose the Church's stand on major political issues. When the Church of Zion failed, the Liberal Party, with its periodical, the Salt Lake Tribune, lived on to oppose Brigham Young and the LDS forces towards the cooperative movement. Sorry, I'm uh... On October 30th, 1869, five days after meeting with the High Council, Elias Harrison and William Godby published statements in the Utah Magazine denying the apostasy, apostasy charges against them. They accused church leaders of tyranny and complained that the saints were not free to think or act for themselves. Convinced that the spirits had spoken to them in seances, both men believed they had been called to reform the church, and they were determined to keep publishing their magazine and to rally the saints to their cause. From out of our mountain valley shall yet be born a banner emblazoned with a wider creed, a nobler Christianity, a purer faith than earth has ever seen, Elias promised. Though he cautioned the saints against reading the Utah magazine, Brigham Young made no effort to shut it down. During his nearly four decades in the church, he had seen opposition movements come and go without lasting success. William Godby and Elias Harrison had recently organized their followers, followers into the Church of Zion and proclaimed themselves the forerunners of a new movement to reform the church and the priesthood. They also began a newspaper, the Mormon Tribune, and aligned with merchants in the city to form the Liberal Party to combat the saints' political dominance in the territory. A few men did resign their membership in the school to join the new movement, and others, including the one stalwart missionary, T.B.H. Stenhouse, were beginning to waver. Eventually, T.B.H. Stenhouse and his wife did leave the church, join the movement, 
and became staunch foes against the church. In New Zealand, the church met with violent opposition, but members in good spirits. In Scandinavia, 1,021 baptized in 1871, although the church was outlawed in Norway. Over 600 new converts in Hawaii in 1872 with members bulging at the seams as they began new building projects. Beginning 1869, a member's way design had to be paid for in full before migration. Well, my friends, we see opposition to the church then just as we see it today. But the church survived, and my guess is not, most of you have not even heard of William Godby. So I don't think there's anything to worry about. I bear testimony that the church is true, and I say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.